The age of Hitler is not, I'm going to suggest, the 1930s and 1940s. It is our own lifetimes. It began in the 1940s, but wasn't really in full swing until the 1960s, and is now, I think, coming to an end. My purpose in these four lectures is to explain why I think it's helpful to see our own times in this way and what it tells us about what may come next. The reason I call this era the period that even 80 years on we still instinctively call the post-war era, the reason I call this the age of Hitler is because he is its most unifying figure. He is our touchstone, our backstop. In a world where we seem increasingly unable to agree on anything, we can all agree on condemning him, or rather the few people who will come to his defense, thereby reveal themselves to be monsters. Even in the war, which has erupted in Europe since February, he provides the framing, not only that Mr. Putin is one of a whole series of post-war villains to be cast in that part, but that he and his regime's propaganda relentlessly justify Russia's war by labeling Ukrainians as Nazis. An accusation which is, is perverse, but I think significant. And that's only the latest of many, many examples. As I hope to persuade you, we define our values principally and ultimately with reference to Nazism, and we can't shake our fascination with them and with their leader. I first remember hearing his name when I was around six years old, sometime in the late 1970s. I remember asking my mother uh, something like, who is the worst person ever? And I'm sure she gave a measured and sensible answer, but she did mention one name. Who else could you have chosen? Who else would you choose? It's stuck in my mind like a burr. Evil is fascinating, and absolutes are as well. My next flash of memory, I mean, it might have been the same afternoon, it might have been weeks later, is of asking her, so has anyone ever written a book about Hitler? And I remember at the time feeling that my question was slightly shameful. My instinct would be that it would be wrong to write a book about a bad man, that it was probably even wrong to ask the question. But I was hungry to know about this, this reference point for wickedness. And to my considerable surprise, my mother replied, oh yes, there's lots of books about it. And she showed me one. High on a shelf was this fat, hardback volume with that name on it in big, barefaced capitals, Alan Bullock's 1952 biography. Now, my childish instinct may have been morally sound, but it was, of course, spectacularly wrong. There are a lot of books about Hitler, more of them every year, not just because he was an enormously consequential historical figure, but because I'm not the only person to have found evil fascinating. He doesn't belong to the serious historians. They have to share him with the storytellers and the mythmakers and anyone who wants to stiffen whatever they're drinking with a shot of cheap moral spirits. We can't stop retelling and reinventing his story and the endlessly faceted story of the war against him. Even now, a lifetime later, the films, the books, the ever more tenuous documentaries keep coming. And there he is in the title of these lectures too, but I'm afraid that's a trick. These lectures are not really going to be about him. They're about us. They're not really even, I'm afraid, going to be history lectures in which I might amass new and unfamiliar evidence to tell you a story you don't know. Instead, I'm going to do something a little more preacherly to tell you a story that I hope you will realize you already do know. A story about our times that will seem familiar. My aim is to put a frame around something that I think we know, to hold up a mirror to our own times at a particular angle and hope we recognize what we see. <laughs>
Two reasons for doing this. One is the historian's reason to help us understand how we've got to where we are. And the second one is the more practical one. The age of Hitler is, I hope to show you, coming to an end. I think on balance that this is a good thing, that our appalled fascination with the Nazis probably doesn't have a lot more to teach us. But whether or not you approve of the Hitler-centric moral universe that we've grown up in, it was at least reasonably stable and based on a very broad consensus. But in the 2020s and beyond, stability and consensus look likely to be in short supply. What is going to follow this age? In the second pair of lectures next week, I'll make some suggestions about where our shared and fracturing values are going, about where I think they should go, and about how we might possibly get there. But today my subject is more historical. Before I come to that, I have a few ground rules to clarify. I keep talking about us, but who do I mean? Well, the simple answer is Western Europe and North America, especially Britain and the United States, not just because those are the two countries I know best, but because their similar but different paths through the age of Hitler have been very influential beyond their borders. But that simple answer won't really do because part of the point is that the values that I'm talking about are, or they claim to be, universal. The wartime allies formally called themselves, during the war, the United Nations. And they bequeathed that name to the new organization that they created in 1945. The whole institutional architecture of the post-war world, above all the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was conceived in the shadow of the Second World War, in an attempt to apply its lessons to the whole planet. Of course, it hasn't quite worked out that way. I think it's of some significance that Russia remembers that war as the great patriotic war, a particular, not a universal struggle. And as Rana Mitter has reminded us, China's vivid memory of the war is different again. Even so, the values of the age of Hitler have certainly been instrumental in shaping events all around the world, especially but not only by informing how the Western powers have responded to them. This has been the age in which the Western powers that won the Second World War have set the terms of global conversation. That's, of course, one of the things that's coming to an end. To see how this has worked, consider what happens when someone somewhere in the world refuses or fails to conform to our shared anti-Nazi values. Occasionally this is done symbolically and defiantly. In the late 1990s, the Zimbabwean government's brutal enforcer and self-described terrorist, Chenjerai Hitler Hunzvi, gloried in his nickname as a means of signaling his ruthlessness and instilling fear. And maybe it worked but it also badly dented that government's already shaky credentials for its anti-colonial virtues. More commonly, people or movements discredit themselves with real or perceived echoes of Nazism. We're going to meet a number of examples of this. Maybe the most obvious is the persistent tendency of many anti-Israeli or anti-Zionist movements around the world to stray or lapse into open anti-Semitism. In the age of Hitler, doing that is crossing a red line, and it means forfeiting much of the sympathy you might otherwise have had. Even Vladimir Putin may have been surprised that his invasion of Ukraine has met with such startlingly different responses than his comparably brutal wars in Chechnya or Syria, or his equally illegal annexation of Crimea because none of those events triggered our collective memories of 1938-40 to 40, the way that this one has. For any would-be tyrant, butcher or dictator anywhere in the world for the past 75 years, a sensible rule of thumb is try to oppress people in ways that are not directly reminiscent of the Nazis, because you are much more likely to get away with it. So, in 
geographical terms, my story is a set of concentric circles, with Britain and then the Anglophone world at its heart, then spreading to the rest of Europe, including the very different cases of Germany and Russia, and then finally with an eye to the rest of the planet. And if that seems Eurocentric and Atlanticist, well, I'm talking about a Eurocentric and Atlanticist era in world history. And defining my chronological scope is equally problematic, because although I've said it's a post-war one, in some ways we need to look back some decades earlier. But I want to begin in 1947, when the American radio network ABC began broadcasting a series called, modestly, the greatest story ever told. It ran for nearly 10 years, was broadcast in over 50 countries, it spawned a novel, and eventually an epic star-studded movie. And that teasing, irresistible title was itself an allusion to a poem called Tell Me the Old, Old Story, written by an English woman in 1866 that had been set to music the following year and become a popular hymn. Now, neither the poem nor the story, nor the radio series, explicitly named the story in question. That's the point. You didn't need to. Everyone knew what you meant. It's, of course, the story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Catherine Hankey wrote her poem, and for decades afterwards, that story was still the most important story in Western culture, and the figure of Jesus had a unique moral authority. The reason that I call the post-war era the age of Hitler is that this is the era when the, the story of Jesus has been replaced as the defining narrative of our culture by the story of the Second World War. How our culture's greatest story became the anti-Nazi rather than the Christian narrative, that's the subject of this first lecture. The point is not that Victorian society on either side of the Atlantic was universally Christian. I mean, it felt at the time like an age of, of, of pell-mell secularization. Friedrich Nietzsche famously declared in 1882 that God was dead and we, whoever that means, had killed him. Alternative philosophies and worldviews were springing up like mushrooms. Darwinian evolution had apparently rendered God unnecessary and had then been warped into a eugenicist theory of a progressive life force by the likes of Herbert Spencer. Historians and archaeologists were reading what now looked like rather overblown conclusions about the unreliability of the Bible. Marxists were rejecting Christianity as oppressive conspiracy. Burgeoning industrial cities were leaving church establishments behind. Spiritualists, theosophists, any number of other movements were crowding in. But the old landscape of Christendom wasn't eroding equally quickly on all sides, and some of the damage looked worse than it was. Scientists and historians might be eating away at Christianity's intellectual credibility, but intellectual critiques have never mattered as much as intellectuals like to think. Plenty of Christians found those critiques easy to answer or to ignore. Likewise, if the social dislocation of industrialization and urbanization undermined the old legacy churches, the currents were also sweeping in new movements like the Salvation Army or the Pentecostals after the turn of the century. And crucially, one vital Christian stronghold was rock solid. Even the fiercest critics of Christianity, with maybe the striking and significant exception of Nietzsche, were united by one thing, which is they accepted the moral authority of Jesus Christ. He, and through him Christianity, still unequivocally towered over the age's ethics in the manner of the, the huge stature of him that was placed defiantly over the city of Rio in the 1920s. Now, it might seem banal to point out that Christians were keen on Jesus, but Victorian and early 20th century Christians were keen on him in a new way. And this is an enthusiasm which they shared with most of their ages atheists and agnostics. Christian orthodoxy, of course, describes Jesus Christ as both God and human, and for most of Christian history, his divine nature has been to the fore. But 19th century Christianity turned anew to his humanity. 
Sometimes this was a cover for attempts to rewrite or demystify Christian doctrine, but often not. In 1865, an anonymous book appeared published in London titled Ecce Homo. This is a, the phrase is a well-known quotation from John's Gospel, in which Pontius Pilate presents Jesus to his accusers, saying, Behold the man. This isn't the first attempt to rewrite Jesus' story as a human life. But notorious earlier ventures by skeptics like David Friedrich Strauss and Ernst Renan had been overt attacks on Christianity and so condemned themselves to niche readerships. But the author of this book, the classical scholar John Seeley, he published it anonymously because he didn't want to alarm his devout family. Seeley's trying something subtler. He's not attacking or defending doctrines about who Jesus was, instead giving a compelling account of him as a man and as a moral teacher. And this really hits the sweet spot of controversy. It makes his book talked about but not reviled. He runs through six editions in the first year. His fans include plenty of resolutely orthodox Christians, not least the about-to-be Prime Minister William Gladstone. By the time Seeley's name does leak out, it's clear his book is nothing to be ashamed of. He's appointed Regis Professor of Modern History at Cambridge, and the royalties from this book serve him and his publisher well for the rest of his life. More to the point, he starts a trend. First a trickle and then a flood of humanized lives of Jesus appear. Most of them were the work of straightforwardly orthodox Christians. Frederick Farrar's The Life of Christ in 1874 so burnished its author's pious credentials that he ends up as Dean of Canterbury. By 1906, shortly after Farrow's death, an astonishing 5,000 retellings of the life of Jesus had been published in Britain alone. <laughs> the old, old story, indeed. Like the story of the Second World War in our own age, this is a narrative that the Victorian era does not grow tired of hearing. And it's not just Christians. Skeptics, free thinkers, agnostics, atheists, a small though combative sliver of 19th century society, have this much in common with their Christian antagonists. They are Jesus enthusiasts. And this goes back a long way. Baruch Spinoza, the 17th century Jewish free thinker who lays the philosophical foundations for modern atheism, despite not really himself being an atheist, Spinoza calls Jesus not so much the prophet as the mouthpiece of God and insists that his ethical teaching is so superior to anyone else's that the voice of Christ may be called the voice of God. And it comes to be thoroughly conventional for radical critics of the churches to make the same point. They might ridicule the notion of a God, but they don't want anyone to think they're criticizing Jesus. Tom Paine, the author of the, the first really popularly successful anti-Christian book, The Age of Reason, Tom Paine goes out of his way to exclude Jesus from his ample list of targets on the grounds that the morality he preached and practiced was of the most benevolent kind and has not been exceeded by any. No stouter an atheist than John Stuart Mill insisted that the authentic sayings of Jesus of Nazareth weren't merely in harmony with the intellect and feelings of every good man and woman, but that they almost constituted true humanity. He says, that they should be forgotten or cease to be operative on the human conscience while human beings remain cultivated and civilized may be pronounced once for all impossible. Now, we might doubt whether this genuflection at Jesus' morals was always sincere. But if it wasn't, then these writers, who generally were not afraid of stirring up trouble, recognised that there was a line they would be wise not to cross. They might despise the riddling Jewish peasant in their hearts, but only a world-class narcissist like Napoleon or a wild provocateur like Nietzsche would dare actually speak out against him. When Bertrand Russell gave his, set out his stall in his 1927 lecture, Why I Am Not a Christian, he gave the notion of God both barrels. But he changed his tone when it came to the question of whether Christ was the best and wisest of men. 
He correctly observed that it is generally taken for granted that we shall all agree that that was so, including, he says, by his fellow skeptics. And in uncharacteristically tentative mode, Russell dares to suggest that I do not believe that one can grant either the superlative wisdom or the superlative goodness of Christ. But this is preceded by an extended passage slathering some of Jesus' ethical principles with fulsome praise. I mean, a century on, this looks almost comically cautious, but it is as far as he dares go. Any more, and he's going to look like a monster. There is, of course, a further reason for Christianity's opponents to praise Jesus, which is that he is the ideal witness against Christianity. Jesus' humility, generosity, the bold simplicity of his ethics, or his radical egalitarianism, these things almost beg to be contrasted with Christian churches and doctrines which display none of those virtues. This is the mood in which Thomas Jefferson claimed to follow the principles of the philosophy of Jesus, rather than a Christianity which he denied its supposed founder would recognize. The 19th century's most famous fictional unbeliever, um, Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov, built his case against the church through his mesmerizing parable of the Grand Inquisitor, the embodiment of the church who puts Jesus on trial, castigating him for his total failure of moral realism, and the wordless Jesus responds only with a kiss. Even Bertrand Russell took the chance to insist that there are a good many points upon which I agree with Christ a great deal more than the professing Christians do. And he dryly observed that although Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin was a most sincere Christian, I should not advise any of you to go and smite him on one cheek. Now, this sort of thing is more than just knockabout fun. It's a sign that the rock that Christianity's moral authority was built on was less solid than it appeared. It's hardly news that there was a visible gap between the teaching of Jesus and the actual behavior of Christians. And for centuries, that perception had been a strength. It had spurred movements for reform and moral renewal. Maybe Europe's and America's churches could have pulled off the same trick in the 20th century. Maybe their moral fissures were already severe enough that they were bound to crumble. We don't know. What we do know is that the crisis that broke them was the defining moral event of the age, the Second World War. Back in the First World War, the enthusiasm which Christians on all sides had sanctified their respective national causes had played quite well at the time, but it began to look ill-judged during the 20s and 30s as public memory of that war soured. But there was now in the, what we call the interwar era, a new enemy. The aggressively, murderously atheistic force of communism, which had seized Russia in 1917 and was spreading its poison across the globe. It seemed self-evident to most European and American Christians in the 20s and 30s that godless communism was the defining threat that their civilization faced. When new regimes began to bubble up in parts of interwar Europe, the main question for Christians was whether or not they were anti-communist. So Mussolini's antics might be ridiculous or regrettable, but whatever else he is, he's not a threat to Christendom. Whereas the radicals of Republican Spain, they're genuinely frightening. The Spanish church was quick to see General Franco's war against them as a struggle for its own survival. And as for Germany, the thuggishness of the Nazis was distasteful, but you know, omelets and eggs. Here's a political party committed in its founding documents to what it called positive Christianity in a country where the centrist democratic parties looked like a spent force, where a communist election victory was all too plausible and plenty of Christians could at least nod along with Germany's Jews being returned to second-class status. After all, they were obstinate Christ killers. 
And the ones who'd broken free of their stiff-necked superstitions were mostly communists. I can feel myself sort of slipping into ironic mode as I, as I tell that story. But we shouldn't be too self-satisfied about our moral superiority. I mean, to us, now, it seems a self-evident truth that fascism in general and Nazism in particular were an acute, a unique, and an intolerable evil that they should have been confronted as soon as they reared their heads. But the plain truth is that most people at the time were slow to recognize this. That as late as 1938, many sober European Christians saw communism still as the more fundamental threat. It is not an accident, it is not a trivial oversight that so many Christians collaborated with or nodded along to or downplayed the threat of Nazism. It was an authentic reflection of their worldviews. That only changes when the insatiability of Nazi expansionism becomes inescapable from 1937 onwards, above all when the Nazi Soviet pact of 1939 makes it absolutely clear who is on whose side. By the time war was declared in Europe in September 1939, then there was a frame, an ideological frame for it. That frame is articulated maybe most famously at the Life and Work conference held here in Oxford in 1937, one of the foundation moments of the modern ecumenical movement. A conference that makes a real effort to transcend not just denomination but also national boundaries to advance a vision of what it calls a world Christian community which would transcend the limits of nationality and race and recover in our modern world the unity which was the ideal of the Middle Ages. It felt like a new idea. Not really though. The war that we now call the First World War was, at the time, and in many year, the years afterwards, commonly called the Great War. A phrase which, as we now tend to forget, was a shorthand for, as the medals issued afterwards said, the Great War for Civilization. Great referred less to the war's scale than to the momentous matter that was seen to be at stake. The Western Allies in 1914 to 18, especially Britain and that enthusiastic latecomer to the war, the United States, assertively claimed they're fighting not just for civilization, but for Christian civilization. Of course, Imperial Germany made the same claims. And now, in the 1930s, it seemed that the same struggle was going to be resumed. Winston Churchill's finest hour speech in June 1940 explicitly claimed Britain's struggle as a struggle for Christian civilization. In the same year, 1940, another complicatedly transatlantic member of the British establishment, T.S. Eliot, who had been a leading participant at the Oxford Conference back in 37, published his The Idea of a Christian Society, which argued that the only alternative to Nazism and communism was a new Christian culture. Unfortunately, he then goes on to make clear just how impossible this was. Eliot's vision requires both governments and entire populations self-consciously to subscribe to what he calls a Christian framework and a positive set of values, so that those who dissent, he says, must remain marginal. I think the impossibility of his vision is just a little too sinister to be charming. But in fact, the Western Allies would end up adopting a subtly different objective. This was not a second great war for Christian civilization. This new struggle quickly came to be known as the World War. The original Great War now began to be redesignated as the first in what was a series. Not necessarily meaning a war fought all over the world. Until the end of 1941, it's very much actually a European war, seen as virtually unconnected to the ongoing butchery in China. Much less of a global conflict than 1914-18 to 18 had been at that stage. But it was a war for the world, 
a war fought in the name of universal principles against an aggressor that wanted to overthrow them. And those principles were, as, um, as, as President Roosevelt and Churchill put it, freedom of speech and of worship and freedom from want and fear everywhere in the world. Besides that, T.S. Eliot's new Christian culture looks particularist and parochial and almost mean. It's Roosevelt's America who coined a, an ingenious new label for what the Allies were defending. Not Christian civilization, but Judeo-Christian civilization. Now, under other circumstances, conscripting Judaism into a supporting role in a Christian drama might have seemed crass. But at this moment, it was an inspired move. I mean, of course, it directly defies Nazism's overwhelming obsession with Jews and Judaism. And contrary to some trends in liberal Protestant theology, firmly asserted Christianity's Jewish roots. But it also makes clear that this newly imagined Judeo-Christian civilization is irreducibly plural. A broad-based alliance, which by going so far as to embrace Judaism, also makes it unmistakably clear that both Catholics and Protestants are part of this united front. It is true that in 1942, President Roosevelt said to two of his staffers, one of them a Catholic, one of them a Jew, that you know that this is a Protestant country and the Catholics and Jews are here under sufferance. But he was joking in his sore-toothed way. And they knew it. By then, America was committed to fighting for a world of religious freedom. And if America's collective religious imagination as yet only extended to Protestantism, Catholicism, and Judaism, the point still stood. Forgive me if I mention here an incident that some of you may have heard me describe before. In February 1943, the American troop ship, the Dorchester, was torpedoed off the Canadian coast. Four military chaplains, two Protestants, a Catholic and a Jew, were on board. And according to the accounts given by the survivors, the four chaplains worked together to hurry men into lifeboats and then distributed life jackets. And when the life jackets ran out, they gave their own to four young soldiers. They then joined hands, singing and praying together on the deck as the ship sank. And reportedly, they were reciting the Shema, the Jewish affirmation of God's oneness, as the waters took them. The four chaplains became symbols of an America united for Judeo-Christian civilization against its godless foes, celebrated from the postage stamp through the memorial in Michigan through to an interfaith chapel in Philadelphia dedicated by President Truman himself. The supporting, even token, role that Jews and Judaism played in this united front, of course, turned out to be more significant than it seemed at the time. It, I mean, it was, of course, universally known in the West that Nazi Germany persecuted Jews and sent them to concentration camps. Wartime propaganda made a certain amount of this, as a prime example of Nazi barbarism. For example, in the 1944 British film, Mr. Emmanuel, the story of an English Jew who naively goes to Germany in 1938 to search for the mother of a child refugee, um, and who in the end is, is lucky to escape with his life. Significantly, Mr. Emmanuel is himself a refugee from Soviet Russia. But compelling as this film is, compared to the reality of what was happening to European Jews in the year that it was made, what it depicts is almost comically restrained. The Gestapo are sinister and brutal, but there are not indiscriminate killings. The film's denouement is that Mr. Emmanuel finds the boy's mother, and she's alive and well, but she's married a prominent Nazi and has buried both her Jewish identity and the fact that she has a son he returns to England to tell the boy that his mother is dead. It's not quite the film that you would have made if you had truly known what was happening in the death camps. Generally, wartime propaganda exaggerates the enemy's atrocities. 
And much of Western public opinion was sophisticated enough to discount propaganda claims on that basis. Most people were genuinely not to know that in this instance the propaganda had fallen short of an almost incomprehensible truth. If some in Western intelligence circles had an idea of what they might expect to find when the death camps were liberated, the shock of the British troops who liberated Bergen-Belsen and the Americans who liberated Dachau in April 1945 was genuine, and the shock of those at home who saw the newsreels equally so. Whether or not they should have expected what they found, they didn't. One measure of that shock is the number of summary killings of members of the SS at the camps by Allied forces, killings which military discipline generally chose to overlook. For a great many of the soldiers who witnessed the camps, it was a formative moral moment. Yet most Christian, even Judeo-Christian armies, are told that they are fighting the forces of evil. They weren't to know that just this once it turned out to be true. For those who'd proclaimed a war for Judeo-Christian civilization and had done so in Roosevelt's sense of a Christian war with Jews and others permitted on sufferance, from that perspective, 1945 looked like a horrifying but a decisive victory. Admittedly, it was a little awkward that the decisive part in this war for Christian civilization had been played by the assertively atheist Soviet Union. But no one had ever pretended that this was anything other than an alliance of convenience. Churchill liked to talk of the Grand Alliance, a term which nicely conveyed both its scale and the ideological distance that it spanned. Nor was anybody surprised when the Western Allies immediately turned back to the confrontation which, with communism from which Hitler had so rudely interrupted them. During the late 40s and 50s, it looked as if the democratic and capitalist West might build its new identity around Christianity, as had happened so often before. I, this is a period of religious revival in the United States. It's the age of Billy Graham, the period when the proportion of Americans who formerly belonged to a church reached its highest ever. In 1954, the words under God were added to the American Pledge of Allegiance. In 1956, the United States' historic official motto, a pluribus unum, was replaced with in God we trust. The existential threat that the American Republic had once faced had been secession and civil war. Now it was godless communism. The Christian resurgence in Britain in the same year, the same era is, is more modest, but it People at the time do think it's happening, especially amongst students in the burgeoning universities who flock to join the student Christian movement. And in liberated Europe, the democratic centre-right is boldly redefined in this period by a string of Christian Democrat parties, whose name declared that they're neither communist nor fascist, nor, Christian in a, nor, nor, nor denominationally sectarian. And in the western zones of occupied Germany in particular, the churches are put at the centre of reconstruction and denazification efforts. They are trusted implicitly, and not always with good reason, to be free of the taint of collaboration. And in the United States, the radio series The Greatest Story Ever Told is a roaring success. The film that was eventually commissioned is one of a string of Hollywood biblical epics from this period a surge of cinematic narratives that seem to echo that Victorian literary surge of Lives of Christ. Christian civilization is ready for its battle with communism. But by the time the long-delayed film is finally released in 1965, the world has changed out from underneath it. A project that when it was started must have seemed like a license to print money, only manages global box office takings of $15 million, which covers three quarters of its production costs. And it receives a critical panning, partly because it's fully four hours long. It's now best remembered for John Wayne's unintentionally comic cameo as the centurion at Calvary. Reverence is no longer the order of the day. The hapless Film producers find their projects stranded on the wrong side of a cultural watershed. 
There have been all kinds of reasons advanced for the sudden, unexpected cultural shift that takes place across much of the Western world in the early 60s, many of them by specialist historians with a much greater claim to know what they're talking about than I have. Um, certainly, I find Callum Brown's claim that, that this truly is a sudden cultural shift in that era broadly persuasive. He would link it to the transformation in gender roles and gender politics that accompanied sexual liberation and, above all, the advent of the contraceptive pill, which is made generally available in the United States in 1960 and in West Germany and in Britain in 1961. The British decision, incidentally, was made by the then Minister of Health, Enoch Powell. 1960 is also the year of the Lady Chatterley trial, which, as Philip Larkin pointed out, was soon followed by the beginning of sexual intercourse. Now, I, I don't want to dismiss the immense impact of, of these changes, uh, not least because in religious terms, their effect was powerfully to reinforce a suspicion which had long been growing about Christian ethics. I've already suggested that the one undisputed role that Christianity provided in Western societies was to provide moral norms as personified in the person, person of Jesus. But it's beginning to appear that Christianity's moral priorities were peculiar. Maybe even that its moral principles were. Readily available contraception made Christianity's traditional norms of sexual ethics seem quaint. At least it made them seem to rest far more on tradition, authority, and the desire for social control than on any moral intuition or reasoning. And of course, these are norms that had been widely violated for many centuries. But the novelty was that people who violated them now could do so and honestly and earnestly conclude that they had no reason to feel guilty. But powerful as it was, I do think this is important, it is only one part of a wider movement around the centrality of Christian ethics, a movement which ultimately looks back to the crucible of the Second World War. Not everybody in the Western world had skipped on from the horrors of 1945 to the comforting certainties of the Cold War without pausing to look around them. Many of those who did pause had to conclude that if the Second World War represented the keenest moral test that Western civilization had ever faced, Christianity had not come out of that test particularly well. It's not just the active collaboration of many churches with fascism and Nazism, as most notoriously in the, 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 the so-called German Christian movement. It's also the painful slowness of the non-collaborating churches to wake up to what was going on. The ancient complicity of the churches in anti-Semitism, which post-war churches were generally leaving behind rather than actively coming to terms with. I mean, of course, that's at the heart of it. But it's only the centerpiece of a wider display of moral failings, which the war had painfully exposed. Many Christians in Germany and elsewhere had either enth enthusiastically or resignedly accepted Nazi or fascist rule, telling themselves that whatever vulgarities or cruelties these crude new masters might perpetrate, at least the Christian family was being preserved. The Jews were being returned to their traditional second-class status. The ghastly threat of communism was being kept at bay. That collective moral judgment wasn't some ghastly misunderstanding. It was absolutely the core of the devil's bargain that far-right movements made with their societies. And if the churches were not fully aware of what they were doing when they made that bargain, it was because they chose not to be. You didn't have to be like Paul Althaus, the German Luther scholar, great scholar, who believed that the Nazi seizure of power in 1933 was the occasion for a national spiritual awakening, which he called a gift and a miracle of God. You simply needed to relax into that sense of self-centered relief. Unpleasant as it all might be, at least the trains ran on time and the communists were kept out. 
And if it was regrettable that the Gestapo were coming for the socialists and the trade unionists and the Jews, well, at least they weren't going to come for you. That very widespread Christian response to the far right in the 30s had been made possible by Christianity's hierarchy of values. These Christians didn't approve of cruelty, warmongering, street thuggery, let alone systematic murder. If they were drawn to the racial theories of the far right, that's generally despite rather than because of their religious values. But the disapproval or unease that many of them certainly felt about these things was outweighed by the value they put on maintaining social order, on defending the public status of Christianity against its mockers, profaners, blasphemers, and on reasserting long-standing Christian sexual and family morals. The judgment that the horrors of the far right was a price worth paying was, by and at the war's end, mercilessly exposed. Two well-known pivotal figures in particular realised this by 1945 itself. A Janus-faced pair of opposites who quite unbeknownst to each other, reached interlocking conclusions from very different starting points. One of them I'll come to in the next lecture, um, and you should feel free to guess during the break who it might be. Um, but for now, we're going to turn to the German Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer had understood what he called the radical evilness of evil, which Nazism represented more quickly than most. And that ultimately leads him to abandon Lutheranism's conventionally supine approach to politics, and ultimately it leads to his judicial murder in April of 1945, two weeks before the camp where he was held was liberated. But his now famous letters from prison, written over the previous year and a half, show him groping towards radical conclusions about where the war had left Christianity. We are, he famously wrote, Proceeding towards a time of no religion at all, men as they now are simply cannot be religious anymore. Those who honestly describe themselves as religious don't in the least act up to it. So when they say religious, they evidently mean something quite different. The idea of secularization was, of course, almost a banal one by this time. But, I mean, you would expect a Christian pastor like Bonhoeffer to, to oppose it. But instead, he has become so appalled by the parody which it seems Western Christianity has become that its demise is to be welcomed, maybe even embraced as God's will. Maybe, he says, Christianity is merely a preliminary stage to doing without religion altogether, or as he famously puts it, an infantile stage which a world come of age has outgrown. His hope was that he would find that religion is no more than the garment of Christianity, so that what would be needed is a religion-less Christianity. But he also knew that this wasn't an answer. As he says at the end of his fullest letter on this subject, the outward aspect of this religionless Christianity the form it takes is something which I'm giving much thought to, and I shall be writing to you again about it very soon. And he does indeed come back again and again in his letters to the question of what this might mean in practice. What might be left when hierarchies and forms and jargon and wealth and power have been stripped away to leave a Christ-like Christianity serving the world in weakness? His letters are full of phrases like, I am thinking over the problem at present, more about that next time, I hope. If he made any progress with it before the Nazis hanged him, his surviving letters don't record it. Maybe his death itself is a kind of answer, but it's not really a practical model for a church to follow. What he didn't expect was that after his death, these inconclusive private wrestlings would be published and turned into a manifesto of sorts their authority sealed by his martyrdom. For Christians in the late 40s and 50s, who were ill at ease with the seamless segue to Cold War cheerleading, who were actually trying to reflect on the global catastrophe that most people were trying to put behind them, for them, Bonhoeffer was a light in the darkness. 
and they were drawn to his ideas like moths. The discontent with churchiness, the moral clarity and urgency which he represented was embodied in 1950s churchmen like Trevor Huddleston or above all by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a careful reader of both Bonhoeffer and of the Mahatma Gandhi with whom Bonhoeffer had once corresponded. One important result of this was that in that moment of cultural flux in the early 60s, some of the most compelling and authoritative Christian voices were advocating not for Christianity and for Christian ethics, as those things were normally understood. They were advocating for secularism. Anglican preachers of John Robinson's generation, many of them were making an earnest attempt to put Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity into practice. The brilliant work done on this subject by Sam Barrett Taylor has shown how Britain's student Christian movement which had been leading a modest uptick in Christian affiliation in the 1950s, in the 1960s redefines itself with an openness policy. Its its new general secretary um, on on the right there next to Dr. King, Ambrose Reeves, declared that we can best serve the churches by ceasing to be a religious society. The distaste in those quotes. The SCM began to define itself not in traditionally religious terms, but by the political causes it supported. And as a result, its membership collapsed. It fell by by 90% during the period 1963 to 73. And that's not an accident, nor is it entirely unforeseen. It is an act of prophetic, you might almost say of Christ-like, institutional self-sacrifice. And in that sense, it's a microcosm of the experience of the Western Christian churches as a whole during these years. Because as they began to absorb the moral lessons of the Second World War, and Bonhoeffer's version of those lessons seemed particularly compelling, um, and, and, and I think that's simply because it resonates so well with how others are already beginning to think. As they absorbed the war's moral lessons, it comes to seem self evident to a great many Christians that the one thing they could no longer do with a good Christian conscience was simply to assert their Christianity, especially not in any way that was divisive or exclusive or made any kind of claim to superior status or knowledge. Even to claim that their story was the greatest story ever told, a claim that had once seemed innocent, almost a banal act of praise, that now felt like an act of arrogance. When secularist critics and scoffers set out to make fun of Christianity, and you know, this is the age of beyond the fringe, they did, a significant number of Christians rushed to join in the attack because they believed, with rather more fervor than the comedians, that Christianity as traditionally defined is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And of course, that conscientious reluctance by many Christians in the West, especially those in positions of leadership, to assert their own traditional doctrines for fear that such an assertion would be exclusive or offensive or discriminatory, a fear that is as much about conscience as it is about about public appearances. That reluctance is, of course, very much still with us. To the extent, then, that Western societies have become secular, One of the reasons for that is that many Christians consciously and deliberately decided that it should be so. But as to what the secularism that was embraced was, we will come to that in the next lecture, which will start at half past 11. So welcome back to the the second of these Bampton lectures. Um, I'd like to to start by going back to, to... something I mentioned in the, in the first lecture, if this is working for me. Um, yes, no? There we go. The sinking of the SS Dorchester in 1943. Now, this is a story that I've spoken about in lectures in different settings m- maybe a dozen times. I, I think it's quite an illuminating episode. But I have to confess that every time I speak about it, it happened again today, I struggle to get through the narrative 
without my voice cracking. I have to talk firmly to myself and tell myself not to be so sentimental. But there is no getting away from it, for me at least, and I don't think I'm alone in this. This story, and others like it, have a visceral emotional pull. And if I take that story apart, it seems to me that every element of it is important. If four chaplains had shown similar self-sacrificial courage during a peacetime maritime accident, that would be a tragic and heroic tale. But it's the context of war, and not just war, that war that gives it its force. If the contingent of chaplains on the Dorchester that night had been different, instead of that rather unusual mix of two Protestants, one Catholic, one Jew, a mix which showcases the Judeo-Christian united front while also reassuringly preserving Protestantism as normative, then even if, they hadn't, if they'd shown the same courage, I don't think it would move me in quite the same way. And it's not just the Dorchester. I find the emotional pull of a certain kind of Second World War narrative to be embarrassingly inescapable, and I don't think I'm alone in this. Neville Chamberlain's radio broadcast of the 3rd of September 1939 announcing the declaration of war was made more than 30 years before I was born, and rhetorically it is nothing special, stiff, understated. But I doubt if there is any one snatch of audio recording that I have ever heard more often. You know, no film or radio drama or documentary seems to be able to resist it. And it still chills my spine every time I hear it. And as to the Churchill speeches, I mean, those phrases have wormed their way into our collective consciousness in this country like holy writ. You may have seen Christopher Nolan's 2017 film, Dunkirk, another one which I admit I struggle to get through dry-eyed. There's a splendid cinematic coup at the very end, in which the dazed and exhausted soldiers find themselves back in the relative temporary safety of Kent. They collapse onto a train, and one of them gets hold of a newspaper, which has a report of Churchill's We Shall Go On to the End speech of the 4th of June. And the, the soldier reads key sections of the speech aloud to his comrade. And he reads them without flourishes, stumbling, halting, very much as an exhausted and not especially educated man might read aloud a text that he's meeting for the first time. The entire scene depends on the fact that we, the audience, know the speech already. We can hear Churchill's cadences. It's the very hesitancy and clumsiness of the reading that helps us to hear the familiar words afresh. Now, normally, the only words that need to be rescued from themselves like that are the words of Scripture. Now, I don't want to make too much of my own susceptibility to this kind of emotional manipulation, though given that I generally try to cultivate the callous cynicism normally expected of an academic, my abject failure in this regard is maybe noteworthy. More so is that no other narrative affects me, I find, in quite the same way. In particular, I notice that I am a professed and believing Christian. But the tragic and noble narrative of heroic self-sacrifice at the heart of my own supposed faith, the Passion of Christ, does not have the same visceral effect on me. I'm well aware that throughout the Christian centuries it often has had that effect, that a great many Christians have found themselves moved to tears, utterly emotionally shattered by the Passion narratives or by poetic or painted or acted versions of them. And I don't say that I'm unmoved, but it usually takes some conscious devotional effort to get that way. And it can feel distant, an echo. The conclusion that I draw from this rather self-indulgent bout of introspection is that I was born in Britain in the second half of the 20th century. And as such, I may, indeed I do, believe in the Christian gospel, but not with the same intuitive immediacy and blithe faith with which I accept, without question, my culture's true religion, and that is the Second World War. In February 1943, an amateur theologian from Oxford travelled to my own Durham University to deliver a trio of lectures, soon published under the title The Abolition of Man, 
This is C.S. Lewis in rather unusual mode, prophet of doom, when his more usual style was what was more uplifting, and also deliberately and self-consciously cross-cultural, explicitly denying that he's working as a Christian apologist. And his theme in these lectures is the necessity of recognizing the objective reality of morality, of a broad but in its essentials, universal code, which he sees not merely as binding on all humanity, but as constitutive of humanity, so that if, as he feared, we succeeded in liberating ourselves from it, or rather if some few humans forcibly liberated the rest, including their own descendants, then the animals that would be left at the end of this process would have irrevocably lost what made them human. And this has become one of his most enduringly successful works, partly because everybody loves Doomsayer, but also because his not entirely convincing claim to be advancing a, a, a general philosophical rather than specifically Christian case has found some, some ready hearers. By, by early 1943, when he delivered these lectures, the war really was global. And Lewis is vividly aware of the war in Asia. Um, indeed, he begins these lectures with a withering takedown of a school textbook written by two hapless Australians, um, whom he uses as, as exemplars of spineless moral vacuity. Um, and in his private correspondence, Lewis admitted that he had chosen them because he shared the widespread view in Britain that the fall of Singapore the year earlier was the fault of Australian cowardice. That awareness of the Asian struggle is part of the context for his decision to assert not Christian, not even Judeo-Christian values, but universal human values. And his rather playful decision to use a Ch to, to misuse a Chinese term, the Tao, to represent that universality. And this is a bold, genuinely inclusive, and also genuinely combative vision. It's properly Rooseveltian in its scope, scooping up all of the world's great civilizations into one grand alliance to confront amoral dehumanization in all its forms. And this is a phenomenon which he warned that Democrats and, of course, communists were susceptible to, as well as fascists. Put yourself in his shoes in 1943, you can see what he meant. The diagnosis of both fascism and Soviet communism as essentially anti-human, um, well, I mean, that's too obviously correct to comment on. Although, even in 43, not everybody could see that. But he had also put his, feet, his finger on the weakest feature of the secularism and scientism of the democratic center-left of the interwar period. The ethics that that political movement taught were frankly underdeveloped. Uh, an ill-formed assembly of benign, quasi-pacifist assumptions whose foundation, if it had one, was a kind of social Darwinism that favoured abstractions like progress um, and had a weakness for eugenics. Lewis goes on to sketch out a nightmare vision of where that kind of progress might lead in his 1945 novel, That Hideous Strength, which is the, the longest, the weakest, and the preachiest of his fiction works. And given those battle lines, hard to disagree with him. But instead, something that he didn't anticipate happened. By 1945, his critique of the ethically vacuous democratic socialism that he saw around him was already out of date. Because as it turned out, his argument was stronger than he thought it would be. The Western world's encounter with Nazism and its atrocities had, even before the scale of those atrocities was fully known, triggered what we can only call an ethical reawakening. The brilliance of Roosevelt's concept of Judeo-Christian civilization, the concept that Lewis was expanding on, was that it allowed a certain set of ethics, the four freedoms of the Atlantic Charter, freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want and fear, it allowed them to be expressed as universals. And it's that concept which drives the extraordinary decision to deal with German culpability for the Second World War in a completely different way from that chosen in the first. You know, notoriously, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 had included a war guilt clause, 
claiming that Germany as a whole, the German people, were guilty of starting the First World War, a claim which was in any case arguable and certainly entirely unhelpful. But the second time around, the Western Allies chose instead to settle the guilt for the war and its conduct on individuals, and to do so not by treaty or by some other form of fiat declaration, but by judicial, sort of judicial process. The Nuremberg trials were obviously victors' justice, and the defendants denied the legitimacy of the tribunal. But the evidence that was presented was real and was pretty much irrefutable. This was the ground on which the victors chose to take their stand in ethical terms, and it turned out to be solid indeed. C.S. Lewis's Tao, his universal human values, turned out to be harder to suppress than he feared they might be. The secular, progressive Western world, which he thought was going to be engulfed by an anti-humanist scientism, instead rushed to embrace and define itself by a new concept, human rights. In the age of Hitler, the post-Second World War age in which we now live, that idea is our shared faith. The concept of human rights is very deliberately formulated by legal philosophers to counteract an alternative idea which is popular in the wake of the First World War, the idea which is implied by the war guilt clause and by a number of other parts of the Paris Peace Treaties, which is the idea of group rights, the idea that underpins principles like national self-determination and ultimately underpins the rise of militaristic and exclusive nationalism. It's explicitly in response to Nazism that we have the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the European Convention on Human Rights in 1950, both of them in turn based on the Atlantic Charter of 1941. But of course the notion of human rights goes back much further than that. The American Constitution had a so-called Bill of Rights attached to it, a title that was lifted from an English document that was a century older. Now, those were legal rights asserted, at least initially, against specific authorities. But the French Revolution of 1789 produced a declaration of the rights of man and the citizen. And that, too, was informed by an earlier text, the work of the Francophile philosopher and slaveholder Thomas Jefferson, who in the American Declaration of Independence in 1776 famously wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Now you'll notice of course that Jefferson doesn't mount an argument for the existence of these rights, nor does he try to enumerate them. He comments, lists a few and he insists that they are self-evident, they are just obvious, which not coincidentally is exactly how clergymen for many generations had claimed that we know there is a God. Subsequent declarations of rights have done exactly the same thing. The French declaration simply asserts that the rights describes are the natural, unalienable and sacred rights of man. How do we know that human beings have rights? We just know. So this is obviously problematic. You know, on one level, Jefferson's claim is just untrue. The existence of human rights is not self-evident. That is to say, a great many people in a great many historical settings have not perceived any such truth. The people whom he kept as slaves might have had something to say about it as well. But, I mean, this is a banal point. I think we all know that the modern doctrine of human rights is a castle in the air. It's a defiant existential assertion of values which we choose to claim without having any really solid philosophical foundation for it. If we're philosophers, that might bother us. But, and this is what I think is important, most of us, most of the time, are not bothered about this at all. Because on a deeper level, for us at least, Jefferson is right. We, in the post-45 era, really do find the existence of human rights and human equality self-evident. The intellectual basis for this doctrine may be weak, but it feels true. It's intuitively true. It is our form of what Lewis called the Tao. 
in, indeed, the, the appendix to Lewis's Abolition of Man has this extraordinary cross-cultural list of examples of what he calls the Tao. So he cites Christian and Jewish and Chinese and ancient Greek and Egyptian and Norse and Native American um, and other cultural examples to show agreement across the piece on values like benevolence, justice, and protection of the weak. Clauses from the UN Declaration of Human Rights could slot very comfortably into his list, the new faith of our secular age. If we try to articulate why we believe such things, the effort feels uncomfortable. It feels like we're questioning something that ought not to be questioned, almost committing a kind of blasphemy. Really, why do we believe in human rights? But the fact is, the fact that we do believe them, down to our core, is not an answer. It is the problem. The closest we can come to an answer, I think, is the one advanced by the UN Declaration itself in 1948, which begins by asserting that human rights are the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, a rather more pragmatic claim than Jefferson or the French had made. And it then goes on to explain that disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from want and fear has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. So this is about the Second World War. I mean, of course it is. It's 1948. What do you expect? It's the experience of exceptionally barbarous acts and the claim that the common people have united around the four rights proclaimed in the Atlantic Charter. That's what underpins the entire structure. The assumption that the common people can be identified with the victorious allies is reflected in the, same, in the way that the United Nations slips from being a term for a military alliance to the term for a universal post-war organization. I suggest that our modern faith in human rights depends almost wholly on the memory of the Second World War and on the understanding of what evil is that came out of it. Now, I mentioned in the last lecture that I was holding in reserve a second character who recognized early on the moral earthquake that the Second World War represented. You may have thought I meant C.S. Lewis, but fond as I am of him, he's too conservative a curmudgeon to truly see the magnitude of what had happened. Um, I was instead thinking of, as a couple of my friends here who I was speaking to guessed, of a German Jew born in the same year as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Hannah Arendt. She escaped the Nazis by the skin of her teeth, reached New York in 1941, and as she meditated on her turbulent experience of the previous decade, and worked on the preservation and recovery of Jewish culture in Germany during and after the war, she began to develop her understanding of the scale of what was taking place. And at the center of it was a phrase of Immanuel Kant's, das Radical Böse, radical evil, a phrase which Bonhoeffer had also applied to Nazism. And indeed, while C.S. Lewis doesn't use that phrase, it rhymes perfectly with his fear of dehumanization. Because what Kant meant by that, as I understand it, was that a person can be sufficiently overcome by the evil inherent within them that it overwhelms and even reverses their humanity. Arendt is one of the first thinkers truly to look Nazism unblinkingly in the face and ask what it meant that human beings could do such things. And Kant's concept is the least inadequate means that she found of explaining it. But she, like everybody else, took time to digest this new world. And you'll be familiar enough with the chronology that I'm sketching out by now to expect that the crux came not in the immediate aftermath of the war, but in the early 60s. And in fact, if we want to select a single event as the moral pivot of this era, I would point not to the emergence of the contraceptive pill, but to the Eichmann trial. The kidnapping, and as we would now say, the extraordinary rendition of Adolf Eichmann, the most senior surviving architect of the Holocaust from Argentina to Israel in May 1960, is a thunderbolt of an event. The painstaking trial 
from April to August 61, pulled the Nazi genocide, which much of the world had been trying to forget, back into the open. And Hannah Arendt spotted the opportunity to test her ideas about the nature of radical evil against the perfect subject. She persuaded the New Yorker to send her to Jerusalem for six weeks to cover the trial, and eventually her observations in the book Eichmann in Jerusalem were published the year after his execution. Now, it may well be, as has often been suggested, that her impression of Eichmann as a colourless bureaucrat, an empty vessel who merely wanted something to obey and carried out a genocide by default, that in this she was mistaken, that she was deceived by the persona that he created to try to navigate his trial. But whether or not he truly was as banal as she claimed, her notion of the banality of evil of its grey inhumanity, its teetering on the edge of nothingness. That resonated not just with her earlier understanding of how radical evil eradicates humanity even from itself, but also more widely with the times. Because in the early 1960s, the Western world is starting to wake up to the memory of what had happened. Quite likely, that large part of the timing of this change is just generational. Young people who had no personal memory of or implication in the war were coming of age, not least in Germany itself. A crux moment often forgotten in this country is the Spiegel affair of 1962-3, in which bold reporting by the West German weekly Der Spiegel about the state of the West German defense forces led to a failed attempt by the Christian Democrat defense minister to charge the journalists with treason. And this was accompanied by a wave of public demonstrations. It's often taken to be the point at which the West German state becomes a genuine democracy. On its face, this scandal isn't about the Nazi past, but of course, it's about nothing else. The underpinning question was, was this to be a state whose people served it, or a state constituted of and existing to serve its people? Was it collectivist or individualist? Was it governed by power or by law? Was it a society governed by the interest of nations or by this intoxicating new notion of human rights? We can use the cinema as a guide. The retellings of the Second World War in the 50s were generally of a national struggle against an enemy of the traditional kind. I mean, that could be somber and bitter, as in The Cruel Sea in 1953, or rousingly patriotic as in The Dam Busters in 55. Both films remarkable for being Second World War films with virtually no actual Germans in them, which is, of course, a faithful reflection of most British airmen's and mariners' wartime experience. But it also reflected the new political reality that West Germany is a vital Cold War ally and that burying past differences was a matter of some urgency. The plot of another British war film of the 50s, the rip-roaring desert adventure Ice Cold in Alex from 1958, turns around the character of a German spy who falls in with the crew of a British ambulance making its way across the Egyptian desert. They only realise his identity after he's shared their struggles and has actually saved their lives. And they end up lying to British military police so that he can be held as an honourable prisoner of war rather than shot as a spy. This kind of thing reaches a sort of crescendo in the... That's the, the, the famous beer in Alexandria. Um, reaches a kind of crescendo in the 1962 D-Day film The Longest Day. Um, in which the impression of the German army as honourable opponents is underpinned by the involvement of several former German generals, large numbers of German actors, and the West German government itself in the production. There's been a, a lot of cri subsequent criticism of this and many other cinematic and artistic portraits of so-called good Germans, of soldiers who are merely do doing their patriotic duty, as Eichmann and the Nuremberg defendants before him had claimed. I'm inclined to be a little more forgiving of this kind of thing. You know, yes, yeah, okay, so there's a Cold War rationale for it. Even so, after a desperate and bloody war, to so quickly move to humanize the enemy, to recognize individuals and to differentiate amongst them, it's a moral achievement of sorts. But already in the early 60s, this is shifting. A bizarre 
example of this comes in Britain's epic answer to The Longest Day, the much-loved 1963 film The Great Escape, which portrays the German armed forces as two almost completely different, indeed antagonistic, entities. The regular armed forces are represented by the Luftwaffe Colonel von Luger, the commandant of the camp, who is an honorable gentleman almost to a fault, and is portrayed as openly opposed to the Gestapo and the SS, who alone are made to bear responsibility for the atrocities. What's relatively new, though, is giving villainous Germans and their actions screen time at all. And, of course, that is something that's only going to accelerate over the following decades. I'll resist the temptation to go through the whole history of the Second World War on film with you. But I will say this much. First of all, on film, and indeed in every other medium, this is the story that our culture cannot leave alone. The French novelist Laurent Binet calls the Second World War our Trojan War. A landmark, he says, a reference, a source of inexhaustible stories, a collection of epics and tragedies. I mean, to see his point, you only need to compare the richness and moral force and complexity of these many stories to the grim monotone in which our few narratives of the First World War are told. And secondly, as we keep returning to these stories, the way we tell them has shifted. Atrocities, the cruelty of occupation, anti-Semitism, racism, genocide. These things have become the center of the story. If you made a romp like Ice Cold in Alex now, allowing the Holocaust to slip by, you would be suspected of Holocaust denial, and probably correctly. Nor is it limited simply to the way that we remember the Second World War. What really shows the depth and breadth of the moral lessons that are starting to be drawn from the conflict is the way it begins to be transposed into other forms. Narratives that don't really have anything to do with the Second World War find themselves bringing in Nazis because they're the best villains. Our modern creed can be summed up by that great philosopher Indiana Jones. Nazis. I hate these guys. You might think, for example, that the appearance of the Illinois Nazi party in the 1980 film The Blues Brothers is gratuitous. And of course it is, but it's not an accident, because what possible better counterpoint could there be to that film's message of anarchic racial inclusivity? The more respectable term for this kind of thing is Godwin's Law, the principle that every argument on the internet eventually ends when someone calls someone else a Nazi. Now, that law exists for a reason, because to call someone a Nazi in our culture is quite literally the ultimate, the final insult. The reason it ends an argument is that it's a punch in the face. It puts an end to any further discussion. What can you say in reply to that, other than maybe to hurl the same charge back at your opponent? It is our final reference point. A century ago, the most potent figure in Western society was Jesus. Now it's Adolf Hitler. Maybe we still believe that Jesus is good, but not with the same fervor and conviction that we believe Nazism is evil. Crosses and crucifixes have lost most of their power in our culture. You can play with them. You can even joke about them. Nobody really minds. But there is no visual image which now packs as visceral an emotional punch as a swastika. The contrarians, the trolls, the shock merchants of our day and age generally understand that this is a line they do not cross. Ken Livingstone, the former mayor of London, had a long career as a gleefully rule-breaking politician spanning three decades. He may have imagined there was nothing he could say that would place him beyond the pale, but it turns out there was one thing. When he said in 2016 on his radio show in the course of criticizing the state of Israel that Hitler was supporting Zionism before he went mad and ended up killing six million Jews and then refused to back down from that rather singular interpretation of the period. He wasn't only expelled from Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party for anti-Semitism, which is an achievement in itself, you might think, but brought his career to a sudden shuddering end.
Now, it may be, as I'm going to suggest in next week's lectures, that the taboo on which he broke himself is no longer holding as firmly as we might once have imagined. But for the time being, it still holds. To put it another way, if you defend Stalin or peddle conspiracy theories about 9-11, you will be seen as deluded. But if you deny the Holocaust, you are intolerable. And when you are ostracized, no one is going to defend you with talk about cancel culture. And rightly so, because we know that in our cultural context, such a claim is never a naive historical mistake. It is always a deliberate attempt to justify the unjustifiable. Holocaust denial is our modern equivalent of blasphemy. Words that deny the deepest moral truth our society is built on and that we know are never spoken in innocence. Let me try a thought experiment with you. Imagine that you hear of some new research being done by historians from an impeccably re respectable institution into the Nazi genocide. And what you hear is that these historians have concluded, after careful analysis of the surviving sources, that the number of Jews murdered in the death camps has been slightly overstated and ought to be revised down. Not by much, the error that they claim to have detected is only a couple of percentage points, so maybe not even as much as 100,000 human lives. Now, re-examining sources and refining claims like that is the kind of thing that historians do, it's what we're for. And there does, in fact, continue to be a real range of uncertainty about the actual numbers. But how do you feel when you hear this hypothetical claim? And now imagine the alternative, that you read a similar report of work done by similar researchers, only this time they want to revise the death toll up slightly. How do you feel about that claim? Well, I'm giving the lecture here, so I have to guess at what your feelings are but I'm fairly confident in doing so. I'm going to guess that the first set of researchers make you uncomfortable. You immediately suspect their honesty, or at least their professionalism. And with good reason, because you are well aware that there are actual Nazi apologists out there who consistently seize on or distort any ambiguous or incomplete or complex evidence they can find in order to minimize or to deny Nazism's crimes. And if you manage to convince yourselves that this modest downward revision of the death toll was, was in fact plausible, I'm going to guess you would still find it disturbing. You would be well aware of how this interpretation would be seized on by Nazi apologists. You might even ask whether the historians were wise to publish their findings, knowing how they'd be twisted and misused. The idea that that iconic number, which even Ken Livingston cited, six million, which incidentally was Eichmann's best guess, the idea that that might have to start being qualified with a probably or an almost, that would be unsettling. It would take a little bit of the force out of one of the central events around which our moral universe is built. Whereas those other historians, the ones who want to revise the death toll up, now they sound sober, judicious, level-headed scholars making their way through horrors. We'd be ready to believe them, grateful even, because they underline, they reinforce what we think about the world. Certainly those are the gut reactions I would have. In other words, we would hear a report of 100,000 innocent deaths as good news and feel a report that the same number of people had not been killed with sinking unease. I suggest this means that we do not generally remember the Holocaust because we want to remember and honour its victims. What we want to remember are its villains. When we say we will never forget, what most of us mean is that we will never forget what they did and what other people in their place, what we in their place, could all too easily do again. The numbers of the dead are simply the evidence. It's a story about evil and about evildoers, not about the human lives that were destroyed. <laughs>
I vividly remember visiting the Jewish Museum in Berlin and being surprised in exactly the way that the museum sets out to surprise you. I had expected to find a museum centered around the Holocaust. I think I had even hoped to find a muse such a museum that would tell me once again the old story around which I've built so many of my values, give me again those comforting certainties, that reassurance that I have my moral bearings and I know what evil looks like. Instead, I found a museum about the lives of German Jews. Not about their deaths. About their long and particular and complicated history, in which the failed attempt to exterminate them is only one episode, a uniquely catastrophic one to be sure, but one by which they should not and will not be defined. I recognized that this was a better, a truer, a more alive museum than the one that I had imagined I was going to find, and I hardly dared admit to myself that I was disappointed. The distinctive feature of living in the age of Hitler, as I would argue we do, is that we don't really want to be told new things about that story. We want to be told the old things over and over, or at least new things that fit seamlessly in with what we already know. That's how we know we're dealing not with the memory of a historical event, but with something more like a faith. I think, in fact, the clearest sign that this mythical understanding of, not, you know, mythical, not in the sense that it didn't happen, but that it's been given that sort of significance uh, of, of, of Nazism, is the way that it continues to be transposed into entirely fictional settings, which lets it be reshaped and purified in the process. And this started while the war was still going on. To many people, it is incongruous, even embarrassing, that the 20th century's best-selling work of fiction is an excessively long, unapologetically archaic, and sometimes rather self-indulgent fairy tale written by a philologist who's a very traditional Catholic and whose most devoted readers were and remain teenage boys. But even if you share the disdain for Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, I don't think there's any gain saying it's cultural importance. Tolkien himself had no patience for allegory as a literary form. He vigorously denied that he'd written one. But if his War of the Ring doesn't mirror the Second World War, which was raging as he wrote the book, it certainly refracts it. And he privately admitted this as much. I mean, Tolkien is an early and a staunch opponent of Nazism, but he's also a veteran of the Battle of the Somme. And he knew that this war was, like any war, an ultimately evil job. So he told his son in 1944. And he used the language of his own developing myth to explain what he meant. Not only, as he said, that there are a great many orcs on our side, but that we are attempting to conquer Sauron with the ring. Such a war might end in victory, but a victory whose effect would be to breed new Saurons. And so what he wrote wasn't an allegory of the real war, but a counterpoint to it. The war as it should have been. The war between a villain who seeks to impose a dehumanizing tyranny and heroes who, despite strenuous temptations and at great risk, decide to destroy the power to impose tyranny rather than to turn it to their own purposes. Now, for all the vividness of Tolkien's depiction of, of, of combat itself, I mean, this is fantastically implausible even in its own terms. But we're not talking about realistic fiction here, we're talking about myth. If we're going to use the memory of the Second World War to reset our moral compasses, then mythical, clear-cut versions of it are what's needed. And as Tolkien warned, although not quite in the way that he meant, we have indeed been breeding new Saurons ever since. The figure of the Dark Lord has stalked through the most persistent and popular mythologies of the post-war era. In Star Wars, he destroys entire planets, he has stormtroopers, jackbooted interrogators, and is ultimately defeated by plucky farmers. In Harry Potter, two decades later, the racial element is much more to the fore. The villain openly pursues a racialized supremacy, 
gives his followers a name, the, the Death Eaters, and a set of symbols which openly mimic the SS. And indeed, by the end of those books and in the most recent series of films, the struggle against those villains is, is being directly overlaid onto the Second World War narrative itself. But the same vision is already there in one of the most compelling and uh, enduring television creations of the early 1960s. The Daleks, Nazis on wheels. In the very first Dalek story in 1963, when our heroes hear their plan to wipe out the entire race of their enemies, they call it murder, but the Dalek they're speaking to corrects them. Not murder, it says, but extermination. A clinical term worthy of any Nazi. And these creatures are our arrant dehumanization made into flesh and metal. And it's a vital part of the myth that they're not robots, but vessels into which a, a warped, corrupted, intrinsically feeble remnant of a living thing has placed itself. This is an evil which is both radical and banal. Now, the debt that these ersatz Hitlers, and there are many others, owe to their real-world archetype is sometimes implied, it's sometimes openly acknowledged, but I think it's always plain. These are the myths on which generations of children in the post-Christian West have been raised, transposing, cleansing the brutal lessons of the Second World War into timeless morality tales. These are the lessons that our culture is determined to teach itself and eager repeatedly to relearn that this is what evil looks like, even though in reality evil rarely appears in such unambiguous dress. So if we ask why it is that Christianity went into decisive retreat in the West in the early 60s and from then on, and the long process of secularization enters a new phase, I think there is almost a simple answer to that question. Because the one key and uncontested function that Christianity had been serving in Western societies up to that point was suddenly redundant. Whatever else Christianity had been, it was a store of value. It was the form of the towel that had a grip on Western culture's collective imagination, so that believers and unbelievers alike accepted the authority of Jesus's ethics as reflexively as we now accept the notion of human rights. But once a new set of values was in place, once a powerful new lodestone had corrected our moral compasses or reset them so that what once pointed towards Jesus now pointed away from Hitler, that subtle adjustment to our moral directions made the old maps redundant. I mentioned in the first lecture Callum Brown's argument about the nature of British secularization in which gender plays a central role. Um, and indeed, given that the idea of women's rights is absolutely linked to the idea of human rights and that both of them represent an utter antithesis of Nazism, and also that women's rights in the modern sense are in some tension with traditional Christian ethics, given all that, I do not disagree with him. But what I actually want to cite is another work by Brown, his remarkable 2017 book, Becoming Atheist. This is an oral history of modern unbelief based on interviews with 85 adult atheists across Europe and North America. Brown's atheists have very varied stories, but when he comes to their ethics and values, he finds an astonishing degree of consistency around a certain ethical code. Two key elements to this code. First is the so-called golden rule of treating others as you would like to be treated, which is a Christian imperative, but as Brown quite rightly points out, not an exclusively Christian one. And then a linked set of principles about human equality and bodily and sexual autonomy. And Brown calls this ethical framework humanism, a word which not many of his interviewees volunteered, but which he says all of them were happy to accept when he put it to them. We might call it the doctrine of human rights. And what makes it interesting, it, one of the things that makes it interesting, is that these people don't describe a conscious process of being converted to or trained in this doctrine. It wasn't a manifesto they'd embraced or a program that was imposed on them. Those of them who had grown up in religious settings recalled that they had embraced this ethic before they broke with their religion. 
And when the breaking point did come, it was either because of a conflict between their religious and humanist ethics, which are similar but not identical, or because their humanist ethics now made their religion appear redundant. The implication is that in the West since the mid-20th century, growing numbers of earnestly or nominally religious people have adopted an ethic which is independent of their religion and in some tension with it, and so have either drifted away from or consciously rejected that religion. Now, Brown, who is a card-carrying humanist himself, claims rather charmingly that this convergence around a shared set of values suggests that these values are indeed a form of what Lewis would call the Tao, a set of human universals on which all people will settle if they are spared the distorting effects of religion or other ideology. He suggests that these values arise from within human experience and indeed that reason alone may construct humanism. This is rather like the way theologians until recently might argue for the existence of God from universal human consensus. Um, obviously it's wrong. Modern humanism is in no sense an expression of universal human values. Its ethical markers, such as gender and racial equality or sexual freedom or a strong doctrine of individual human rights and a sharp distinction between the human and the non-human realms, in a long historical perspective, these are very unusual beliefs indeed. The fact that those values appear intuitively obvious to Brown and his interviewees and indeed to me, that is not the answer. That's the problem. The answer, rather, I suggest, is that those values are the sea in which we all swim. We live in, still in the age of Hitler, and our moral compasses are set. Some of us have overlaid religious values onto those fundamental secular values. Some of us may even tell ourselves that our religious values are the fundamental ones. And the fact that we have persuaded our religious values to agree with those secular ones is a happy coincidence. We're slow to recognize the depth of the moral consensus that defines our society, partly because of the ancient inability of fish to know what water is, and partly because one of the particular convictions that defines our self-image in Western societies is that we are hopelessly divided and fractured into irreconcilable pluralities. I want gently to suggest that this image is a little overstated. There are profoundly divided societies in the world today, there have been more so in the past, but ours are not, or not yet, among them. We do accept, happily or grudgingly or helplessly, the same broad envelope of political and economic and cultural institutions. We are capable of moving together with remarkable speed as a society when we need to. I mean, witness the astonishing consensus that allowed our collective life to be utterly transformed in a matter of days with virtually no social disorder at the start of the pandemic two years ago. Our disagreements, our alienations, bitter and profound as they are, are still contained within a shared bubble of values. The bubble that allows us still to shout at each other. Godwin's law still holds providing us with a shared insult, a label that no one takes as a compliment or not without exiling themselves from our social world. It's often said by social conservatives, often with an elegiac air, that in our pluralist society we no longer have a shared sacred narrative or a set of values to hold us together. The unspoken subtext is usually that we need to return to an older, likely a Christian set of values. But the truth is we do. We have the narrative of our standing against Nazism, the story of the Second World War, our Trojan War, our paradise lost, our sacred story, the one that we tell and retell and reimagine so as to keep immersing ourselves and our children in what evil truly is, in how our parents and now grandparents and great-grandparents fought to defeat it, and how we must do so again in our own time and in our own way. Those are our shared values, and in them we will be content to live and die. Or at least that's what we might have said until recently. That's the song that we might have sung defiantly to ourselves to keep up our faith. 
because now in the 2020s it really does look as if this shared set of values is beginning to unravel and our societies are heading for darker places. In next week's lectures, I'm going to explore what that might mean. And I will suggest that it may be a good thing that it is indeed time that we left the age of Hitler.